This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks so much, Nina. And it really is a pleasure and an honor to be addressing my colleagues on this topic, which I've been studying for the past several years. So I'm going to go right into my PowerPoint. And in this talk, I would like to address what is now well known both about the physical and psychological and physiological benefits of time in nature. So over the past 30 years or so, there has been an increasing body of evidence that has confirmed that being active and out in nature or sitting passively in a natural scene or based on some studies, even viewing a picture or video of nature can provide a number of short-term health benefits and can even provide impact over many years. The belief in the benefits of spending time in nature has precedents that stretch back thousands of years. This is not a new idea. Uh, Aristotle, for example, stated in On the Parts of Animals, for in all natural things, there is something marvelous. And William Shakespeare in his lesser known play Trollius and Cressida stated, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin. More recently, the famed biologist and entomologist E.O. Wilson examined our innate human affinity for nature and our love of natural objects in his book, biophilia. In the years since the publication of that book, the term biophilia has come to be used as a kind of shorthand for humans' love of the natural world. So why do we have this connection with nature and how does it affect our bodies and brains? Physiological stress is commonly monitored through salivary cortisol levels. Uh, the higher the cortisol level, the higher the degree of stress in the body. A number of studies have compared homogeneous cohorts of individuals who were asked to spend a set amount of time walking in a natural setting like a woodland or along an urban street. In every case, every study I have read, cortisol levels declined significantly for the nature walkers, but not for the urban walkers. There's a wonderful recent book that I recommend titled The Well-Gardened Mind the restorative power of nature. The author, Stu Sue Stewart Smith, states in one part, being out and about on busy city streets means having to process a lot of auditory as well as visual information. And it disrupt, disrupts our ability to focus. Horns, sirens, alarms, are all intended to put people on alert and keep them safe, but they drain our energy in trying to filter them out. Navigating a tide of people on a busy street, pedestrian street is exhausting at the best of times. Everyone is going at a different pace and both our physical and mental space is under threat in different ways in the city environment. Well, what Sue Stewart Smith is describing 
in that passage <clears throat> is something called attention restoration theory, which was first advanced by the two people you see here, Stephen and Rachel Kaplan back in 1995. It focuses on the amount of time each of us spend in directed attention. Not only making our way along urban streets, but also staring at computer screens as we are all doing right now, engaging in conversation, attending classes, reading books, or writing grant proposals. As a result of prolonged con concentration, an individual may show pronounced signs of attention fatigue. Time in nature has been shown to relieve our directed attention, thereby improving cognitive functioning, such as memory recall and the ability to perform concentration tasks. An alternate theory was first proposed by this individual, Roger Ulrich in 1991. <coughs> and it is referred to as stress recovery theory. This theory takes an evolutionary approach and posits that our sympathetic nervous system is conditioned to respond to threats by increasing stress hormones and preparing us for fight or flight. Now, that increase in stress hormones and readiness for fight or flight is really helpful if you're about to be attacked by a woolly mammoth. But it's not so great in our current stress-filled world. So Ulrich proposed that natural settings activate our parasympathetic nervous system, allowing us to rest and digest. In a recent interview that Ulrich provided on the design of hospital gardens, he stated, there is a pattern of evidence that suggests well-designed gardens can reduce stress, lower blood pressure, and increase the positive aspects of experiencing nature as gardens reduce pain. Nature seems to reduce pain by blocking stress and allowing patients to recover themselves and reduce their discomfort. So in the literature, there has been a lot of back and forth over the years about whether the cognitive or brain focus of attention restoration theory or the stress recovery focus of SRT is more accurate and predictive. Supporters of ART tend to focus on measurements based on the central nervous system, while supporters of SRT tend to base their measurements on the peripheral nervous system. There was a fascinating new research report, thank you Christopher Dunn for alerting me to it, by Emily Scott and colleagues called Toward a Unified Model of Stress Recovery and Cognitive um, restoration in nature. It proposes a way to unify these theories through the vagus nerve, which links the central and peripheral nervous systems. Scott and her colleagues propose that stress recovery and cognitive restoration co-occur and are bi-directional. They further suggest that cardiac vagal tone can serve as an index of both attention restoration and stress recovery in the human body. So recovery both of our directed attention from the brain 
and our stress mode from <clears throat> the sympathetic nervous system. Other recent research has looked at the relationship between urbanization and the increased incidence of depression, or conversely, how spending time in natural settings can be associated with declines in depressive states. Gregory Bratman from University of Washington and his colleagues found that one possible mechanism for this might be the impact of nature exposure on rumination. Rumination is defined as a maladaptive pattern of self-reverential thought associated with heightened risk for depression and other mental illness. They showed that in healthy participants, a 90 minute walk in a natural setting decreases both self-reported rumination and neural activity in a part of the brain called the subgenial prefrontal cortex. Whereas a 90 minute walk in an urban setting has no such effects on self-reported rumination or neural activity. This evidence that a nature walk can reduce the incidence of rumination and resulting depression could be valuable as we consider the students with whom we work or the colleagues with whom we regularly interact. Other studies have looked at the relationship between exposure to nature and sleep patterns. In one study based on a large national survey of adults, the researchers found that those individuals that have little exposure to natural settings had a much higher incidence of um, insufficient sleep patterns, especially among men over 65. So this could be re, uh, due to either reduced stress levels or increased exercise in those frequently going out in nature or some combination of the two. I have frankly been both impressed and somewhat skeptical of studies that have found that time in nature or living in greener locations can positively impact individuals' lifespans. Gasson and colleagues reviewed all of the studies that had been, that had been conducted on this topic through 2016 and published a paper titled Residential Green Space and Mortality, a Systematic Review. Of the 12 studies that fit their criteria, they found that the majority of results showed a reduction in the risk of mortality because of a reduction in cardiovascular disease for residents in the, high, in the areas with the highest residential greenness. So it makes sense that lower incidence of cardiovascular disease would translate into longer lifespans. Another association between stress, depression, and longevity may be based in our telomeres, the protective caps at the ends of chromosomes. Recent studies have suggested that chronic stress potentially impacts cellular aging through telomere shortening and subsequent consequences on our health. Shortened telomere length has been linked to, linked, likened to numerous age-related diseases, such as increased cancer risk, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and even dementia. 
This link can be particularly pronounced in cancer patients and their caregivers. Yet another fascinating new line of research focuses on ways in which plants themselves can impact our stress levels. Phytoncides are volatile organic compounds given off by a really wide variety of plants from garlics and other members of the onion family to oaks, cedars, locusts, and even pines. When these phytoncide molecules are taken in through our nasal passages, they've been shown to both reduce blood pressure by reducing sympathetic nerve activity and to boost immune functioning by enhancing natural killer cell activity. And I'll get back to the NK cells in a moment. Hideki Kashawadane, a physiologist and neuroscientist at Kagoshima University in Japan, revealed that sniffing linalool, an alcohol component of lavender, has the same effect on a mouse's brain as feeding it Valium, but without the dizzying side effects. A researcher who I greatly admire at the University of Chicago, Francis Quo, has focused on the role of these natural killer or NK cells on the physiological and biological mechanisms underlying the benefits of time in nature. NK cells are important in the human endocrine and immune systems and are associated with boosting immune functioning and providing rapid responses to viral infected cells. Considerable evidence now indicates that natural environments can enhance the percentage and function of NK cells and intracellular anti-cancer proteins in lymphocytes. In two Japanese experiments, a three-day trip to a forested setting resulted in increased NK cell activity and the expression of anti-cancer proteins in both males and females. And for the female subjects, those effects lasted at least seven days after that trip in the forest. Even ordinary soils can benefit humans in ways that have been revealed over the past 20 years. Mycobacterium vacae are non-pathogenic bacterial compounds commonly found in soils. When introduced to mice, they stimulated a group of neurons, which in turn increased levels of serotonin, which as we know are associated with feelings of well-being and happiness, and simultaneously decreased levels of anxiety. And those may not be the only benefits of spending time around plants and soil. During the Second World War, Finland was forced to cede a large swath of territory known as Karelia to the Soviet Union. And you see that here. In the second half of the 20th century, the Finnish side became modernized while people on the Soviet side maintained a traditional lifestyle. And by the 21st century, according to a study carried out by researchers at the University of Helsinki, the prevalence of allergies on Finland side of the border region was significantly higher than those people living on the Russian side. And what the researchers have determined is that the Russian kids had more and more diverse bacteria on their skin. Put simply, 
The Finnish youth were leading overly sterile lives, which negatively impacted the microbiome of their skin. Interesting stuff. This point is reinforced by a popular author, Jack Gilbert, co-author of a book titled, Dirt is Good, the Advantage of Germs for Your Child's Developing Immune System. And he states that our addiction to indoor-based, uber-clean lifestyles is weakening our children's defenses against illness. Of course, that was written before the current pandemic and practices on cleaning of one's hands and skin have certainly been altered by that. So given all of these benefits of time and exposure to nature, the question naturally arises of how much time should a person spend in nature each week? Colleagues and I recently had a scoping review published in Frontiers in Psychology that asked the question, what is the minimum time dose in nature to positively impact the mental health of college age students? What we learned is that as little as 10 to 20 minutes, two to three times a week, can significantly reduce salivary cortisol levels, blood pressure, and heart rate, increase cognitive abilities and recall, and improve overall mood. And if all of that is true for 18 to 22 year olds, it certainly should also be true for younger and older people. So one of the most important things I feel that colleges and universities can do is to provide for the physical and mental health of their students. For the past several years, I've been heading up an approach to encourage students to spend more time in nature to contribute to their overall well-being. The mission of our Nature RX at Cornell program is to reduce stress and thereby increase physical and mental health in students through their engagement with nature and to cultivate in students an increased appreciation of nature. One component of the Nature RX program at Cornell is our student club. When we're not in a pandemic, members of this club organize things like weekly nature walks, natural area cleanups, invasive plant, plant removals, geocaching contests, trips to nearby or regional natural wonders, or indoor events such as herbal tea tastings. Another way of involving students is through the Nature RX course that I offer. I have twin goals in that course of exposing students to on campus and near campus natural areas that they may otherwise not have discovered and having each student develop a deeper and more personal relationship with nature. We do that through weekly explorations to beautiful sites, through required readings, and through reflective essays that the students write each week. So a companion course is currently being offered by colleagues at UC Davis. And my partners at UC Davis and I in 2019 um, had our students take a nearly identical pre and post survey uh, after the first class and after the last class of the semester. And what we were able to ascertain from those surveys is 
as a result of these classes, the students felt more comfortable in nature, um, more likely to go out in nature if they were extra stressed or anxious, and to recommend time in nature to their friends. So in the course of a semester, nearly every member of the student body winds up at the campus, campus health facility. Uh, this, of course, is not a typical year. So um, the Cornell Health Clinic is generally not open. But in a typical year, many of the students who arrive at Cornell Health are suffering from stress, anxiety, depression, sleep deprivation, physical cutting, obesity, inactivity, or social isolation. For such students who are manifesting conditions like that, one therapeutic approach is a nature prescription based on a concept that was developed by this individual, Dr. Robert Zarr, who many of you may recall visiting here and speaking in this series in September of 19. Zarr was the creator of a not-for-profit firm called Park Rx America, whose mission is to decrease the burden of chronic disease increase health and happiness, and foster environmental stewardship by virtue of prescribing nature during the routine delivery of health care by a diverse group of health care providers. And Park Rx America now works with clinics and clinicians in over 35 sites around the US and Canada. So for clients who are dealing with mental or physical issues, prescribing time in nature may be of real benefit as part of a total therapy program. Initially, Cornell healthcare providers were handing out paper nature prescriptions to students um, that said, please go out in nature, time in nature is very beneficial to you and recommended a few sites that they could go. But prescribing time in nature is now included as part of a student's electronic health record. As you can see here, NatureRx discussed and recommended. So in the 2019-20 academic year, staff at Cornell Health had devised a protocol for confidentially and anonymously surveying all those students who had received a NatureRx prescription as part of their EHR so that we could determine the degree to which this prescription was influencing the frequency with which they went out in nature um, their overall stress rec, uh, levels, and even their academic performance. Unfortunately, when the pandemic hit, all of this had to be put on hold. So we are hoping to resume this type of surveying this uh, fall, coming fall semester. Yet another component of the NatureRx program is this responsive website, naturerx.cornell.edu. In it, we provide photos, descriptors, and GPS-based directions to 15 <coughs> natural and horticultural sites around campus, most of which are managed by Cornell Botanic Gardens. Through their use of this site, we hope that students will come to recognize that nature is nearby 
and doesn't require a large block of time to go out and explore. Nature, especially on a campus like Cornell's, is all around us. To further broadcast messages about the value of time in nature to all students at Cornell, the Cornell Health Communications team has developed a series of e-posters for media walls around campus, like the foyer in the Plant Science Building on the first floor. And these posters say things like, did you know that time spent in nature can help improve your exam scores? Did you know that time in nature can improve your sleep patterns, can improve your social life, can reduce overall stress levels? And for each of these posters, um, you can't see the fine print, but we do cite studies that have verified this benefit. I'm also the co-author, as Nina mentioned, with the late Dr. Greg Eels of the text, Nature Rx, Improving College Student Mental Health, that was published by Cornell University Press in 2019. In it, we go in depth into the mental health crisis that currently exists on American campuses and which has only been exacerbated by the coronavirus pandemic. We discuss the proven benefits of spending time in nature. We provide a stepwide guide to developing a Nature Rx program and profile for campuses, including Cornell, that have developed Nature Rx initiatives. We end the book by considering ways in which Nature Rx programs will figure into the future of the American University. For the past couple of years, we've also developed a nationwide <clears throat> campus Nature Rx network, which currently includes 25 campuses across the US some very large like Yale or UC Davis, others quite small. The network put on a day-long symposium this past October sponsored by Cornell and Vice President Ryan Lombardi and has recently organized a steering committee and six working groups to address communications, teaching, campus projects, research, anti-racism, and the annual symposium. To conclude, spending time in nature should never be seen as a cure-all for all human maladies, but it can be integrated into therapeutic approaches to contribute to overall well-being for people of all ages. So thank you. And at this point, I would be happy to answer questions from anyone. Thank you, Don, that was great. Oh, as always, very interesting things that I'm sure none of us really knew about. But uh, are there any questions for Don? Don, this is Marvin. Uh, so there are urban campuses, uh, and then there are fairly rural campuses, or there are campuses that focus a lot on outdoor activity, like Hamilton universities. Have there been studies done where they've sort of matched cohorts, you know, and compared student stress levels on those more rural campuses focused on outdoor activities versus those that are very much in the middle of an urban center? I'm not aware of any studies that have specifically addressed that, Marvin, but there is a new app that was developed by a research group at Stanford, which using uh, GPS technology is actually quantifying the amount of green um, that is available from a given setting. 
And one of the points that we make in the Nature Rx book is that typically very urban campuses like NYU or University of Chicago will borrow nearby parks um, as settings where Nature Rx programs can be conducted. Thanks. Sure. Um, Christopher Dunn asks, how does forest bathing relate to the points that I've been presenting? So forest bathing or Shinyin Roku uh, is a Japanese technique that provides opportunities for people to have intense and intimate experiences in primarily woodland settings. So as opposed to walking through a woodland and perhaps occasionally checking your iPhone for email, in forest bathing, there are a number of prescribed activities that allow an individual to develop that closer relationship with nature that I was describing earlier. And forest bathing is really catching on in the US. Um, there is a, a forest therapy association and I've attended um, one of their virtual workshops and they're wonderful. I was curious how people go about like, um... If, if there is a like pretty clear like defining difference between like what is natural um, and what is not natural and how some uh, well, like you're talking about like parks and urban environments or like um, some areas in between like if you plant like trees along like an urban sidewalk like how, do do those like intermediate um, efforts to like add to nature how what, what big of an impact do those have? It's a really good question, Connor, and there is some research going on now to try to quantify the quality of natural settings to see if those that are ranked as being of higher quality actually have a greater impact on the benefits that I've been describing. But I also long ago adopted the attitude that nature is what we make of it. So if someone is crossing over Triphammer Bridge and utterly ignoring BB Lake and Triphammer Falls while they stare at their iPhone, they're having a less meaningful or impactful nature experience than someone who's walking along the sidewalk on Tower Road and studying the red tail hawks that are in the trees. So it can be a very subjective thing, but also there is research going on now to quantify it. Um, Manushi has asked, hi Don, having an indoor plants in living or study spaces also have benefit for stress? What kind of indoor plants in such cases? So there is a huge um, resurgence of interest in indoor plants currently, uh, probably partly uh, based on how much time all of us have been spending indoors. And yes, uh, there have been studies done by uh, Roger Ulrich, who I mentioned early in this talk, who has shown that having greenery in interior environments can positively impact mood and reduce overall stress and anxiety levels. Uh, and by the way, I don't think it makes a difference uh, what type of greenery um, you have. Um, Christopher Dunn also says uh, the point about telomere length is an interesting one and has been shown to decrease in other stressed individuals. Telomeres can regenerate in younger individuals, but not in older ones. So getting younger people into nature is really critical. 
so much of the research that uh, I that either I'm involved with now or that colleagues are involved with has looked at or is looking at the impact of time and nature on young children. I've just read a fabulous review by Louise Chaula at the University of Colorado, who studied young people's attitudes about nature and did that by conducting a scoping review of many, many previous papers. And what she found is that young people's interest in nature and young people's concerns about current environmental crises are not necessarily mutually exclusive. That if environmental challenges are introduced properly and in concert with introducing young people to natural wonders that children can accept the challenges and understand that they can make small steps to make a difference. Well, if there are no further questions. Uh, I actually have one. Uh, okay. My name is Ron Lantman. I work with the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program, and we have been doing a lot of education around tick risk. And we hear a lot that people have rising anxiety about getting bitten by a tick. And that's one of the things that we're trying to counter that you can keep yourself safe while still enjoying going outdoors. I wonder if you've seen any indications of that within your studies or if you feel like it's something that might need to be addressed as the condition gets worse. I have not seen any specific studies that relate to the fear of ticks, although I agree with you, Joellen, that um, dressing properly and checking one's body after uh, a time in nature um, can largely mitigate against uh, the risk of tick bites. I have seen several studies that specifically address fear in nature or fear of nature. Um, everything from snakes to spiders to simply being unfamiliar with being in nature uh, due to having grown up in a very urban environment. So those fears can be very real. And I think in such cases, it's really imperative that the individual be introduced in a supportive and gradual way to nature sites rather than being dumped in the middle of the Great Smoky Mountains. Thank you. Sure. Well, I really appreciate everyone's questions and comments, and I uh, encourage you to email me if you have further questions um, or if you would like me to cite specific studies um, that I included in today's presentation. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.